Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and you're listening to episode 157 on the Carnegie Diplodocus with Dr. Mike Taylor of the University of Bristol. So this isn't an episode that I recorded, but it's by one of our new team members. So I'd like to introduce you all to Sophie Pollard. Hi, Sophie. It's great to have you here. Welcome to the team. And just as a way of introducing yourself, can you tell us who you are and what your paleontological background is? Hi, Dave. Thanks so much for having me. Um, So I've just finished an MSc at the University of Bristol, where I focused on the biomechanics of arthrodid jaws. I'm generally really interested in biomechanics, probably a bit more than I am in fossils. I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, That's all good. (laughs) Um, um, Arthrodia? Arthrodias? Was it? Yeah, I pronounce it arthrodias, but I don't know. What are those? So arthrodias... Um, large placoderms towards the end of the Devonian think Dunkleosteus. Okay, so what is it about the, the jaws that you were looking at? Was it just like bite forces? Yeah, so just general FEA to look for uh, stress resistance in the jaws. And then we did that like across a bunch of ontogenetic stages to look for allometric trends as they got bigger. And yeah. So like the, the little ones, they they were able to bite at this force but as they grew did their bite force increase at the same proportion as their bodies did kind of more or less and you kind of find a very slight negative allometric trend Ah. meaning that the smaller ones are slightly more robust which it contrasts with a lot of the other literature on other animals but then the literature on the other animals is generally based on things that really specialize when they get older okay so for example t-rex they they like allometrically ha- get much much stronger with increasing size that's interesting so is it is it fish that you would say that you're most interested in someone's on the street saying like oh sophie you're a paleontologist so what are you most interested in you fish so i i would say that i'm a lot more interested in the method than i am in any particular group so if it's got weird jaws or it's got it does something weird then i'll generally be interested i think uh arthrodids are really interesting temnus bundles like large amphibians mammals pretty much anything if it's got jaws or if it runs i'm quite happy looking at it and so um then looking forwards you you've done your msc is it are you looking at PhDs? Are you stepping outside yeah. of academia? Yeah, I'm. I'm hoping to keep uh, to stay in academia uh, to keep doing research. Hopefully, kind of expand my skills as much as possible. Oh, awesome! It's going to be great to see you on that, you know, journey as you uh, contribute to PaleoCast. Thank you. So, um, in PaleoCast, though. What would you say your dream interview would be? Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a difficult one. Re- I mean, honestly, whatever sparks my interest at the time, I quite enjoy just kind of going into a deep dive on something and having a look. Hey, that's exactly what I do, to be honest. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, if you want kind of a, f- a funny answer, I guess... Uh, if you could get a time machine, just go back and record a bunch of dinosaurs. I think that'd be yep, both just very funny and pure very vocalizations. <laughs> <laughs> just how, what is it like to be a T Rex right now? Wrong. <laughs> I, I expect everyone would probably listen to that one. Um, so then, turning back to this interview, dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. Uh, you uh, are speaking to Dr. Mike Taylor. Why did you decide to speak to Mike? So I saw Mike's talk at SVPCA back in September and I thought that it was a really kind of, it it made it a sort of really cohesive story and I thought it would be a really good introduction to interviewing and constructing a podcast episode for me. And it's also just a very interesting story. Mm, It really was. I really enjoyed listening to it, in fact. Uh, I hope you enjoyed doing it it wasn't too daunting as your first interview (laughs) yeah i really did enjoy it so as a reminder there's an accompanying blog post on the website with any relevant images or links to papers please subscribe wherever you're listening and please enjoy my first episode (laughs) 
Hi, Mike. Thanks for coming on to the show today. Um, by way of introduction, how about you just give us a little bit about how you first became interested in paleobiology? I thought you were going to do the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, well, like every uh, well-brought-up child, of course, I was obsessed by dinosaurs as a kid. Um, and like most of us, I grew out of it. But for reasons I can't really explain at all, uh, in my early 30s, I guess as a sort of um, early midlife crisis, the obsession reared up again. And at that point, uh, I was in a position to, to start reading technical literature in a very tentative kind of way. So um, I got onto the dinosaur mailing list on the internet, which is still around, although it's, it's heyday is a, a, a little way in the past now. And uh, I read a bunch of papers that seemed relevant to my interests. And along the way, I read one that I, I thought this was so bad, it's so badly written, and it makes its case so poorly, that in my arrogance, I thought, oh, I could do better than this. Yeah, so that's what made me think, uh, maybe I'll have a go at, at actually functioning as a paleontologist rather than just being a fanboy. Yeah. Um, it took you a while to get into paleobiology if, it, if you waited until you were in your 30s. So what were you doing up until that point? And if you hadn't got into paleontology, what do you think you might be doing instead? Well, I, I, mean, I definitely would be um, a computer programmer, as indeed I still am in my day job. So all my uh, paleo work has been uh, evenings and weekends and just the occasional week that I can um, extract from my annual allowance of vacation and go and visit museums. So, which I love as well. I mean, I really enjoy my, my day job. I love the fact that um, I'm not competing with all my friends for the tiny, tiny number of paleo jobs that are out there. And uh, I'm probably paid better in this field than I would be in paleontology as well. So, uh, although there are times, that, of course, it'd be nice to do it full time. There's a lot to be said for making my route. Do you find that there's a lot of interaction between your day job and paleontology? Do you find like... Any any kind of cases where you can use your experience in one for the other? Much less than I expected. Um, so some comes up. Um, when I started out in paleontology, I expected that a lot of what I was doing would be largely computational. So my first paper I submitted, which actually was rejected without review, but still, I wrote it. It was an analysis of dinosaur diversity, and it was based on a bunch of programs I'd written to analyze the database. Um but uh, I've not really done a lot of that kind of thing. And, and the other way it goes is in my day job in programming, I work for uh, a tiny, tiny multinational company. There's 20 of us across, I think, five countries and six U.S. states. And we work mostly on libraries, software for academic libraries. So being involved uh, as an academic and scholarly publishing and all that side of things actually does give me sometimes useful perspectives for that part of my job. Yeah, so perhaps not so much interaction with the paleontological world, but lots of interaction with academia and the academic world. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So your kind of specialty is sauropod vertebrae. Yeah. That's very specific. So what made you specifically want to look at sauropod vertebrae? Well, I, I mean, I jokingly say that I, I specialise in the mid-posterior dorsal vertebrae of brachiosaurid sauropods, but uh, it's, it's not quite as limited as that now. Um so every aspect of sauropods, really, except perhaps the skulls, the, the most tedious part of the anatomy. But, <laughs> um, and particularly, I'm fascinated in, in how they lived and how they worked, rather than just uh, mm. osteological details of particular bones. But the reason I'm particularly associated with sauropod vertebrae, I guess, comes back to a most valuable friendship I made in paleo, which was um, right at the beginning of my sort of larval phase in 2000. Uh, the new sauropod dinosaur, Sauro Poseidon, was described. And the paper came out in the days before open access. The only way to get hold of a copy that I could see was to email the author and ask him to send me a photocopy, which he did. Uh, and that was Matt Wadle, who's become very rapidly became my best friend. And we've collaborated on oh, probably a dozen papers by now. Mm -hmm. So... Um, that particular paper, the Sauroposidon one, was about the sequence of four cervical vertebrae. So because of that paper and also because of the conversations I got into, the vertebrae became the initial focus of, of my obsession and my research. And that's why when we launched our blog, we called it Sauropod Vertebrae Picture of the Week. Mm -hmm. Which is a good thing, I guess, to plug at the end of the episode. Oh, let's yeah. plug it right now. Yeah. yeah. Mike has Mike has a blog. The the talk that this entire interview is based on is on there. So if anyone wants to go and see that. 
Yes, svpow.com, svpow.com. It's been going for uh, 16 years now. There's just a wealth of stuff accumulated on there. Um, some of it's serious, some of it very much not. Lots of tutorials for people getting started in paleo. Uh, lots of stuff about um, scholarly publishing and uh, open access. Mm -hmm. And maybe not so relevant to listeners, but very good if you're looking to construct an interview and you need questions. <laughs> 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 yeah so moving on to specifically what the interview is about so you've done a lot of work recently on the Carnegie Diplodocus you've done yes. obviously the talk at SBPCA and then you've got I think one paper out and a couple more coming out in the exactly. next few yeah. months um, so what specifically got you interested in the Carnegie Diplodocus like most things I've worked on it it was an accident really so uh, I what I actually was interested in is a single cervical vertebra BYU 9024, it's in uh, the Brigham Young University Museum of Paleontology. And it's 1.4 meters long from the uh, tip of the, uh, we call it the cotyle, the ball at the front of the vertebra, mm -hmm. uh, the condyle, sorry, and the cotyle is the back end of it. And it's the single longest vertebra uh, of anything that's been found up to this point. And it's usually described as being part of Supersaurus. But when Matt Whaler and I most recently looked at it, we found that it shared a lot of features that we'd picked out as being diagnostic of Barosaurus, which is a much better known dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And if our interpretation of that vertebra was right, it's a, a ludicrously oversized Barosaurus, something like twice as big as the one that they have uh, the mounted skeleton of in the American Museum of Natural History, rearing up in the atrium. So what I wanted to do was just write a paper about that vertebra and explain why it's Barosaurus. You're getting a very long answer to your, to a very simple question. <laughs> I hope that's okay. That's good. That makes my job easy. So in the uh, introduction of that paper, which is in progress, I found myself uh, writing about, well, what do we mean by Barosaurus when we're comparing this to Barosaurus? Uh, what are we thinking about? Because the type specimen of Barosaurus is quite crushed and, and doesn't really turn up that much in the literature. What we mostly mean is the AMNH one, the American Museum of Natural History. And the more... I found myself writing more and more about that in the introduction until it became apparent that that needed to be pulled out and become a paper of its own. So one of the papers that's sort of 80% done, uh, which I'm doing in collaboration with people who worked on the mount back in the 90s, is about that mounted skeleton and the elements that went into it uh, mm -hmm. and how that has given us our concept of what Barosaurus is. But in the introductions of that paper, I found myself writing about What's the source of all the cast elements that have gone into that skeleton? Because it's not all Barosaurus. Uh, AMNH6341 is the specimen that it's billed as being a mounted, uh, mounted cast of. But like almost all sauropod specimens, big chunks of that are missing. And it took a long while to dig in and find the history of, of where the missing parts came from. And it turned out that story was so fascinating that uh, that got pulled out and became its own paper again. And that's the one that is published on the Concrete Diplodocus of Vernal. And to really briefly summarise that paper, I'm going to slightly break the chronology <laughs> here. There's a, a, a copy of the Carnegie Diplodocus uh, was made in concrete in Utah. And then a, a, a new moulds were made from that concrete cast. And from those moulds, mm -hmm. new casts have been made, including a replacement one that's standing in that same museum in Utah now, but also it became the source of a lot of the missing parts in that Barosaurus mount because Diplodocus and Barosaurus are closely related. So that's how I found myself accidentally writing that paper to concrete Diplodocus of Vernal. So papers within papers about moulds within moulds. Yeah, exactly. And, and then the, the final part of this very long answer is that the introductory section of that paper was about the original Carnegie Diplodocus. And I wanted just to be able to say basic things like uh, which specimens make up that original mounted skeleton. And the answer to that turned out to be incredibly complicated. So that, again, has kind of budded off into another paper, which is about 90% done. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that formed the basis of my SVPCA talk. And that's, uh, all three of these papers, I want to be really clear, uh, have a ton of collaborators. Uh, there's, there's, I think, eight or nine of us all together working between those three historical papers. So it's it's very much not just me, but I, I have kind of wound up actually writing the bulk of them. Yeah. 
So you've given a pretty good introduction there to the Carnegie Diplodocus that I think our listeners would probably recognise as Dippy. You don't really like that name, do you? Why is that? No, I really don't. It's it's just uh, it's this trivialising diminutive. It's what you might call a, a small, badly behaved child, and instead, you know, it, it's it's one of the best preserved and most widely recognised dinosaurs in the world, and it, it really should have a, a name that gives it a little bit of dignity. I think. Hmm. So there's a, a Titanosauriform in the Natural History Museum that I've been working on forever. Um, and I, I really should have my wrist very firmly slapped for taking so long, so long over it. But that's known informally as the Archbishop. And I feel like that's a much better, you know, it has a little bit of a sense of dignity and, and respect to it. So that's the kind of name that poor old Dippy should have. <laughs> um, so Dippy, if I can call it yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. Is- one of uh, many casts that was originally made, I can't remember when, but I'm sure you'll tell me when you start answering the question. Um, uh, how many of those were made originally and how many are still knocking about? Yeah, there were 10 made originally. Uh, well, five and then another batch of five. Uh, they're all around in one form or another. Uh, none of them has really got lost at this point. So the, the original skeleton was found in 1899. Uh, in, I believe, Sheep Creek, Wyoming. Uh, And that was on an expedition from the Carnegie Museum, uh, funded and inspired, really, by Andrew Carnegie, the wealthy industrialist, who, like uh, a lot of wealthy industrialists, wanted to establish his name as something that people would still be talking about decades and centuries later. And, of course, he chose a really great way of doing that, by, by funding dinosaurs and the museums that would house them. So that specimen is, is the holotype of Diplodocus carnegii, obviously named after Carnegie. And that was um, held in the Carnegie Museum and was being prepared to be mounted. But before that was done, uh, Hatcher in 1901, John Bell Hatcher at that museum, published a, a descriptive monograph. It's one of those classic monographs that still gets referred to all the time today. And in the back of that monograph was a plate containing a a reconstruction of what he thought the completed skeleton would look like. Um, And it's not bad, actually. Obviously, there are things that would look different today. Most Mm -hmm. notably, the the forefeet are splayed out when they should be vertical, and the tail is too short. But it's a a beautiful piece of art, as well as being of scientific value. Mm -hmm. And Andrew Carnegie had a a framed copy of that plate in his castle, Skibo Castle, that he had in Scotland. And when the King of England came to visit as you know, people will do that with sufficiently wealthy people, and saw this uh, skeleton on the wall, he immediately said, well, I, I want one of these. How can I get one? And Carnegie was, um, how to put this delicately, he was certainly one who liked to hang around with uh, very influential people and heads of states, and, and he was a bit of a star hunter, I think. Yeah. But also had... Uh, a genuinely noble vision of bringing an end to war by encouraging these heads of states to engage in negotiation instead and arbitration. This was genuinely his, it became his life goal by this stage in his life. He had all the money he needed. And uh, rather than thinking, I'm going to spend all that money on buying a social network and destroying two thirds of its value, (laughs) the plan was end war. So you can't knock him for ambition. Yeah. Although right at the start of the 20th century, I can't imagine it went amazingly. Well, I mean, we'll come on to that. Of course, so there's genuinely tragic uh, aspects to this story. But that was his goal. So um, initially, he planned to to have his museum staff find another real Diplodocus and give it to the King of England. Uh, it quickly became apparent that that wasn't something you have a lot of control over. You know, you yeah. <laughs> so um, Holland, uh, W.D. Holland, who ran the... Is it D? I'm not sure about his middle middle initial now. Anyway, Holland was the director of the museum and he persuaded Carnegie that they should instead make a plaster cast and send that to London. Mm-hmm. And at that point, Carnegie thought, well, if we're going to all the trouble of making the moulds and making casts, why not make five moulds and send them to the crowned heads of Europe? And, and in this way, I'll just get into their circles and be in a position to encourage them to uh, take up my much better approach to international relations. Yeah. So that's that's why the first five were made, and and they went up in places like Berlin and Paris, and I believe St. Petersburg, uh, 
and the whole process basically went so well that they thought let's make five more and, and they went on to various other locations. As reasons to study paleontology go, I never thought that because it's great for international relations would really get in there at any point. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a fantastic dream. It's, but as you rightly say, you know, uh, it was only 10 years after this process started that uh, the First World War broke out. And yeah. it was obviously devastating for all sorts of reasons, for all sorts of people. But among other things, the, there's a sense that it kind of broke Carnegie's health and, and mm-hmm. left him uh, very dispirited. And he essentially didn't last much longer after that. Yeah. Um, okay, so you talk about a lot of, there's a lot of incomplete skeletons with sauropods. So the Carnegie uh, Diplodocus itself, how much of it is just kind of one individual? How much of it is other individuals of the same species and how much of it is just other things altogether? A good bit of it is from one specimen, uh, CM84, that's the holotype of Diplodocus Carnegie. But I would guess sort of depending on exactly how you count it, 60 to 70% of the skeleton. So that includes the whole vertebral column from the second cervical back through the neck, the torso and the hips uh, into the first sort of third or so of the tail. So it's a a really good uh, vertebral column Uh, and a bunch of ribs, uh, most of the hind limb bits, but it's missing forelimbs and and crucially to a lot of people, it's missing the skull. Mm -hmm. Um, because the skull is so diagnostic for most animals, it's kind of difficult to tell whether two specimens are of the same species unless you have the skull. And because there's no definitive skull known for Diplodocus carnegii, it's, it's then kind of impossible to answer your the second half of your question, which is how many of the bits substituted in are from the same species. Yeah. Um, so with skulls in particular, they... Obviously, as skulls go, they're very fragile because they have to be very high up. How common is it to actually find them when you find a sauropod? Oh, I mean, incredibly rare, unfortunately. Um, uh, people have joked that sauropods evolved a lifestyle that didn't need heads because they're, they're so <laughs> rarely found with the skeletons. And when you do find them, they're, they're very fragile construction and they tend to disarticulate and you'll just get fragments here and there. So the the very famous case is that uh, Brontosaurus was found without a skull and and given completely the wrong skull when uh, the American Museum mounted its skeleton in 1904. But that's, um, in some respects, an understandable mistake because it's just so rare to find good quality skulls. Yeah. So you mentioned that, I think you mentioned this in your talk, that a lot of the parts of the skeleton um, were created using casts or they were sculpted. How exactly yeah. would the sculpting process have gone? Well, there's, there are three different sources, really, of elements to fill in that original mount. Some are real bones from other specimens, mm-hmm. including CM94, which was named as, the I think, the co-type in the original paper. Um, and they, they're pretty good matches. Uh, and some, some other bones from other specimens that are mostly pretty well related. Others, as you say, are casts. Now, it's not... The records don't really survive, so a lot of this we can't say for certain, but it seems likely, for example, that the ilium on one side, the hip bone, is... uh, No, that's a bad example. That's an example of a sculpture, because we think it was sculpted to be the mirror image of the one on the other side. Uh, But others are casts, and others uh, are sort of scaled-up casts, and obviously that's easy to do these days, and it was in the 1900s, because you you can make a model by scanning something and 3D printing it. And if you're doing that, you can scale it however you want. Yeah. And back in those days, would it have been just more of a case of you find the best sculptor you can and hope they do a good job? Yeah, exactly. So when they were um, doing those first set of casts, and well, the moulds and the casts, the Carnegie Museum hired a crew of three or four uh, young Italian sculptors who had a lot of experience of plaster casting uh, to do things like busts for art museums. Um, Agostini, Serafino Agostini was the leader of that group and stayed at the museum for the rest of his career and was still working on uh, doing various casts and sculpts right well into his 60s. Well, so moving on from how the skeleton was made to how it's changed over the years, Mm. you've mentioned already a few of them, but what would you say are the big major differences that you'd see between the skeleton then and what the skeleton would look like if you went and saw it today? Probably, I would say the biggest difference is in the forelimbs and particularly the four feet. 
So the, the one real howler that should have been avoided at the time when the original skeleton was mounted, which, by the way, was a year after the London cast went up. So the, mm -hmm. the London cast was the first mounted sauropod skeleton ever. Uh, but when the, the real material went up, the uh, left humerus, the upper arm bone that was substituted in, was not from another diplodocid, but from a, a Camerasaurus. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's not a good match at all. So that was one of the things that needed to be replaced. And infuriatingly, again, you know, we talk about the records from things that happened up to 100 years ago. Uh, they often don't survive or they get lost or, or a new curator comes in and throws out all that old paperwork because who needs to see all that? We don't know for sure when the humerus was replaced. Um, and we've got some photos from the intermediate times that are, that are sort of ambiguous because of the angle they're taken from. We can't tell whether it's the old or new humerus. Yeah, and I'll find a figure for this to put um, in like a little blog post that'll go along with the episode. But I think it's it's quite obvious to tell that the humeri they don't really match each other when you right. put them next to each other. One's a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, uh, and um, skinnier as well. The humerus um, and the feet also were, and there were two problems with them. One is they were taken from a Camerasaurus skeleton specimen. Mm -hmm. Perfectly reasonable because no one at that point knew what Diplodocus feet looked like, so it's, it wasn't obviously wrong. But not only were the bones wrong, they were placed in a, a posture that even at the time there was reason to think was wrong, which was with this very splayed out forefoot, uh, more like the lizard. Whereas it's, it's now known and has been for a long while that uh, mm -hmm. sauropod forefeet held the digits essentially vertically in a kind of semicircular arcade. Yeah. So there have been a lot of replacements of those through the years. Uh, and also work has been done on the various mounted casts around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So they all look different from each other now. Yeah. So have all of the casts more or less been improved at some point to kind of reflect science better? Or? Pretty much all had something done to them along the way. Yeah. Um, so the London one, which I we've got better records for than most. Uh, its tail being raised in the 90s was probably the biggest difference. Yeah. So until then, it had the dragging tail posture that everything had back in the old days. Mm. And from memory, it's a lot nicer to kind of stand under it and you can see it wisping around above you. It is much nicer. Yeah. So the, apparently the curators at the Natural History Museum have been saying for a long time that the tail needed to be raised. And it didn't actually happen until people in the commercial thought, side of the museum thought, oh, we can get more banqueting tables in if we lift the tail up. So... That sounds about right. Yeah. But the, the four feet are still completely wrong. Um, I I saw the Dippy Returns exhibition, I think it was six months ago, something like that, uh, where that skeleton came back from its tour of, of the country. And even now it has the, the old camera sword four feet in the old splayed out posture. Wow. With like, I guess, the wrist essentially still you know, directly on the ground. Yeah. Really surprising. Whereas the Berlin cast... Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's still the original material. They have their cast of the camerasaurid metacarpals, but they've at least reposed the forelimb, so it's it's vertical. Yeah. So it reflects it better from a biomechanical point of view. It does, yeah. But the metacarpals are about twice as long as they should be because they're from this camerasaurid. So the original Carnegie mount has actually had a, a couple more replacements of its forefeet since then. And at the moment, the ones it has are, are probably closer to being correct. Though, of course, we still don't really know what the four feet of Diplodocus carnegie look like. But if you, you can probably find, um, I can send you illustrations from the in progress paper that, that contrasts these different four feet. Mm -hmm. They're amazingly stubby, the, the ones that we currently think are most likely to be correct. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not a sauropod person, so you'll have to forgive it if, if it's Why ever not? questions. So, <laughs> so um, is there any particular biomechanical reason for the metacarpals to be shorter in the Diplodocus than it would be in the Camarasaurid? Um, we're getting a bit speculative here, but in, mm -hmm. in general, Diplodocids, so that's Diplodocus, Barosaurus, Apatosaurus, things like that, yeah. I have shorter forelimbs relative mm -hmm. to hind limbs in general, and I think the shortened metacarpals are part of that. And it seems at least possible that part of the reason for that is that they were much more uh, frequent rearers than other mm -hmm. sauropods. Diplodocus in particular, um, if you model it in 3D and figure out the centre of mass, it's almost at the hips because it's got such a hefty tail. So just contribute having the weight further back. 
yeah, it wouldn't have taken much at all for Diplodocus to rear up in the air. So it's possible that that's how it did its high browsing, rather than needing elongate forelimbs like a brachiosaurid would have. Amazing. So moving on to the thing that you've already got the paper out about, the concrete Diplodocus. Yeah. That So that's pretty much where the moulds went immediately after the first 10 were made or not? Well, not immediately. No, they, they just sat around in the basement for 20 mm. years doing uh, nothing at all. Um, and, uh, well, nothing except gathering soot. So they <laughs> they seem to have been quite close to the boiler in, in the basement. So by the time they were acquired by the uh, Field Museum in Utah, a uh, field house rather, sorry. Field Museum is in Chicago, the Utah Field House. Is in Vernal in Utah, and the molds were going to be thrown out as one of these um, clean sweep projects that incoming administrators often seem to want to do. Yeah, but luckily at that point, the curator of dinosaurs at the Carnegie Museum was uh, Leroy Kay, who was a, a Vernal native, so he managed to arrange for the molds to be given to the museum in Vernal instead. But the first thing they had to do when they got them was just a ton of cleaning just to to get them so they could be. Yeah. Oh yeah, I can imagine. Quite a sooty looking dinosaur stood outside the museum otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so did they originally go, oh, we can make a concrete one to put outside, or did they get the moulds and then decide what they were going to do with it afterwards? I am it's actually not clear in the records that survived, but it seems likely the plan was always to put them put it outside because uh loads of the the, the papers and newspaper reports that came out after the mounting said that it was too big to fit in the museum and it was a, a small museum building at that time. Yeah. So, and obviously that's why concrete was chosen. The, the weather in Vernal is pretty crazy. It gets incredibly hot in summer and incredibly cold in winter. Mm -hmm. So they would need something really robust to survive a year or two. Yeah. So is this the only case that you know of of a dinosaur being cast in concrete? No, I don't know if there are others, but I've, I'm, as far as I'm aware, that's the only one. And people who love concrete, you know, you're welcome to read the paper, which goes into a lot of detail about the, the different aggregate blends that they, they tested out and the changes they made along the way. About how long did it last outside? Because I imagine it would have started to wear away. Yeah, it did. So they, they had a, a maintenance program. It was repainted from time to time, but there's only so much that you can do that way. And so it lasted 30 years, which in that changeable climate, I think is pretty impressive. So did it have the same inaccuracies as the original casts? Were any of the changes made before the concrete dinosaur was put up? Or Yeah, I, I wondered about that for a while until I, I came to the, the obvious realisation that whatever changes have been made to cast since then, the moulds themselves wouldn't have been changed. Yeah. So the, the concrete cast that was made in 1957-58 was... Uh, pretty much identical to all the casts that have been made in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. So any anything coming from those casts now as well would likely have the same inaccuracies? If only that were a problem, because the, the casts don't seem to exist. And, and to me, this is one of the, the tragedies of this whole story. These um, kind of historically super significant moulds that had given rise to these skeletons on four continents and they basically got lost. They were they were shipped to the Children's Museum in Rocky Mount in uh, I think sixty two or so. And they had a long running project to try and cast uh, uh, another outdoor mount from those molds, and it never really got off the ground and kind of staggered to a halt sometime in the late sixties. And there is no surviving record of what happened to the molds. So if anyone finds something mold shaped in there in their back room in a museum. <laughs> Well, I mean, it would be fabulous if that happened, but I don't think anyone is likely to have them without knowing because they're, they're big. You know, there's three tons worth of moulds and the, it seems most likely they were left in a uh, an old aeroplane hangar on a highway outside of Rocky Mount and that little airstrip has been demolished since then. So I think the moulds are probably destroyed along with them. Sand or some rubble somewhere. Yeah. So you did mention that there was actually some new moulds created from the concrete cast, though. When was that? Yeah, that was the that was the brilliant solution, really, to the problem of the mould decaying. And so this is 88, 89. Uh, originally, there was a plan to work with a museum in Los Angeles to, to do this work, to make new moulds and to take casts from those. But uh, reading between the lines, that museum realised it didn't have any money, and not long afterwards, it was bankrupt. But there's an organ organisation called Dino Lab run by... James Madsen uh, in Salt Lake City, 
that specialised in uh, museum mounts and casts and moulds. So they signed a contract to do the same thing. And the deal was that they would repair the old concrete cast, first of all, to get it in good enough condition that they could take moulds from it, then make the moulds and then make a new cast from lightweight plastic, which the Utah Museum would get as part of the deal. But also that Dino Lab would then have the right to make new casts from those moulds and sell them on to other museums. But the Carnegie Museum, as you can imagine, got wind of this and thought, well, hang on, if you're doing that, we want a cut as well. So it all got a little bit complicated commercially, but they did manage to get it to work. So how many new moulds in total have been created? Or not not new moulds, but new casts? Yeah, I mean, the answer yet again, unfortunately, is that the records are not comprehensive. So we have some accounting that shows uh, there are five or six of them in Japan, in various locations in Japan, three in two different locations in Florida. Uh, and of course, as we know, uh, they were also used to provide missing parts and things like the American Museum's Barosaurus mount. And by implication, we assume the similar uh, Barosaurus mount in places like the Utah University Natural History Museum and possibly others. But uh, I don't have a comprehensive accounting. So probably knocking about in all sorts of places. Yeah, quite likely. So because these new molds were created from concrete, would that have affected the quality of the moulds at all? Or would it be really any different from a mould created from an original bone? Yeah, there is a loss of quality for sure. So remember as well, it's not just that it would take that the moulds, the original moulds had decayed by this point. Yeah. And I think the Carnegie Museum thought that they were already too decayed to be used before the field house in Utah found a way to make it work. And then so they made the concrete cast, which then stood outside for 30 years, becoming further eroded. So without a doubt, there's there's a loss of some quality in things like bone texture and maybe some of the subtler laminae. But with that said, there's a those original concrete casts are, are currently on a temporary exhibition in Price in Utah. And I've seen some photos of that exhibition and they're not in bad nick as it goes. You know, the, the overall shape is, is very apparent. And the, I think a, a layman possibly wouldn't notice the difference. Still looks like a dinosaur. Yeah, unless you're really into vertebral surface textures, you know, you're probably going to be okay. And would these newly cast skeletons, would they have the same inaccuracies as the original skeleton would have had? Uh, yeah, not inaccuracy so much as uh, imprecisions, I guess, as, the, yeah, as a result of the erosion. Yeah, that's right. But again, the Utah Fieldhouse in its new location now has their lightweight Diplodocus cast mounted in a, a really nice atrium where you can walk all around it at ground level and uh, at head level. And so I spent a fair bit of time looking at it and I, I didn't find myself thinking, oh, that's gross at all. So it's, you know, it, it, it's nice. It's impressive, really, given all the things it's been through. Mm -hmm. So the things like the splayed feet and the mismatched humor eye, would those also be in the, in the newly cast specimens or would they have been changed recently as well? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's the kind of thing you'd think I'd know the answer to, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I need to uh, revisit some of my photos and, and see what, what the answers are to those questions. And I imagine it would change completely depending on the case, which museum got it, whether they wanted to change it or not. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, you know, it's often the case, I think, the scientific staff desperately want to make changes and there just isn't the funding to make those things happen. So, so you also mentioned that there's bits and pieces made from the moulds that were made from the concrete diplodocus. My original question was going to be, how many times would you estimate that this has happened or like how many sauropods around the world have a piece of the Carnegie Diplodocus but it's probably quite a difficult question so are there any notable examples? Well I would my guess would be everywhere that has a Barosaurus probably has bits filled in using that specimen so there's one at the Royal Ontario Museum for example completely separate Barosaurus skeleton that's missing a fair bit and I, I would be pretty surprised if that hadn't been filled in with Carnegie Diplodocus. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned that because it's a useful reminder to me. I need to get onto the curator there and, and see what he has. Probably segues into another three papers and another three projects. <laughs> That's possible. Um, actually, there's, there's an important point to be made here, which is that fantastic mounting projects take place like the AMNH Barosaurus and the one in the Royal Ontario Museum and even the original Carnegie mounting. They tend not to get written up in a, in a scientifically informative way which is why I'm coming along 100 years later, 120 years 
and trying to figure out what went into that original Carnegie mount from, you know, scraps and bits and pieces in magazines and, and newspaper accounts of the speeches that various dignitaries gave when exhibits were opened. So I would love it if it became a kind of routine thing that when one of these big mounts goes up, the people involved uh, write up exactly what was done and why. And speaking of trying to look back at newspaper articles and stuff, there's a very good example in your talk that's available on your blog as well yeah. from the 70s about the concrete cast, which I do recommend everyone goes and has a look at. It's a good laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 50s, even that. So it definitely embodies a lot of 1950s uh, assumptions and stereotypes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so there's a lot of cases here where, you know, there's lost bits and pieces, there's information that's lost. What are the really notable parts of the story that you think are still untold? Well, I mean, uh, it's, it's only kind of partly untold because the paper that will tell them is, you know, it's largely there. And by the way, you can read all the in-progress manuscripts. Uh, they're all up on GitHub and you can follow the work as that's happening. Uh, GitHub.com slash Mike Taylor and you can find them there. Um, I suppose the Russian cast is one of the ones that had the most striking history. It's been moved around between various different museums and taken down and hidden away and put up again. And there are amazing photos of it in one of its incarnations, not as it was originally mounted by the Carnegie team, but in one of the other museums it was moved to, where somebody decided to give it this bizarre posture with widely, widely splayed elbows. So the photograph is taken from directly in front of it. Its chest is down close to the ground, and its elbows make sort of 90-degree angles with the because they stick out so far, like it's trying to do a press-up. So almost like a lizard with a splayed posture. Uh, not even that, because with the lizard, the, the upper arms would be horizontal and the, the lower arms would be vertical. Uh, but in this case, the, the feet are kind of where they should be, more or less under the torso. They've just got these weirdly inverted elbows. Ah. Very strange. Very strange. I'll have to go look at that because I'm struggling to even picture it. Yeah, it's all on the blog. Mm -hmm. So if you could just find out anything about the Carnegie Diplodocus right now you just ask a question and someone would tell you the answer no matter how difficult it is to find the answer what would you ask well I mean the, the kind of fun one I guess would be what actually happened to those molds so there's a, a really odd historic mystery there and I, it would be really nice to get to the bottom of it and just possibly even find them in somebody's barn in North Carolina but the more esoteric answers would be things like um it's it's obvious in the photos, as you've said, that the upper arm, the humerus in the original cast is wrong. But I don't really know what's going on with the lower arm bones, the radius and the ulna. I don't know whether they were from a camera saw as well, and if so, when they were replaced, and if so, by what. So there are lots of other little details like that. Uh, the tail is really complicated. And even now, even after the major remount that happened to the original uh, mount in 2007 when everything was taken down and reprepared and put back together even after that we don't really know for sure exactly which vertebrae in that tail are from which specimen or even which ones are real and which ones are very good uh, carvings in wood wow yeah so that part maybe we could fix just by going up on a, a step ladder and inspecting closely and there are so many little details of it some amazing sculptors if you can't tell the difference well, it's part of the problem, you know, that they did it so well. Um, and it's a problem even in uh, better known parts of the skeleton. So we talk as though the neck and the torso of that original Carnegie specimen are in amazing shape. Yeah. We can't easily tell how much that really is the truth and how much bits of it at the time were restored in plaster and painted over so very brilliantly that you can't tell what's real and what isn't. Wow. So would it even be like up to the point where you might have to get out a CT scanner or, you know, something like that to actually look inside it to try and work it out? Yeah, but uh, I, I can't imagine we get to do that with the Carnegie's iconic mounted dinosaur. Yeah. And again, you know, when that big remount was happening in 2007, I'm sure there was plenty of opportunity for people to, to make those determinations. And I don't know whether they did and the records haven't survived 16 years or whether that just wasn't done and whether the focus was just on restoring it to be the best possible um, gallery exhibit. Yeah. So the Carnegie Diplodocus, it's obviously a very influential specimen. There's pieces of it all over. You can recognise it probably in your local museum if you've got a big sauropod. Are there really any specimens of sauropods or other dinosaurs that measure up in terms of that? 
I don't think so. I think it's the, the best known single dinosaur in the world. Um, partly because it's in so many different countries, not just uh, a lot of different museums around America, although that's true as well. But, you know, I've mentioned, um, already mentioned Paris and Berlin and uh, the Russian one that was initially in St. Petersburg and has moved on. But there are others as well. Bologna in Italy, there's one in Madrid, there's one in um, Mexico City, there's one down in Argentina. So it's its influence has just been massive and it's very much kind of shaped popular perception of what a sauropod looks like, I think, to an extent that's a bit misleading because Diplodocids, so Diplodocus and Apatosaurus, as awesome as they are, were a relatively short-lived clade. They were fairly limited in, in space as well as time, so they're not at all representative of what typical sauropods were like. And yet when someone who's not a paleontologist thinks of a sauropod, they basically think of Diplodocus. So they may not be the most common, but definitely the coolest. Definitely the most, uh, the one that's wormed into people's minds most. I should give a shout out to Stan the T-Rex because he's turned up in a lot of places as well. So I don't think as many or as widely spread as the Carnegie Diplodocus, but that's probably the second best known individual dinosaur. Mm -hmm. We're coming to the end of the interview. I'll do a silly question because that's what Dave usually does and I'm copying his format. So if you were a sauropod skeleton, where would you most like to be displayed and why? Oh, gosh, that's really interesting. So I think the best display in the world at the moment is in the uh, Museum for Natakund in Berlin, where they have a mounted giraffe titan, and it's flanked by Diplodocus on one side. It's one of the Carnegie casts, and a Dicreosaurus on the other. So you've got these three very different sauropods all sharing a space, and it's one of those lovely buildings with um, just a glass ceiling and lots of natural lights. Even though it's an old building, it's, uh, you know, it's just built with lots of glass panels. So that would be a great place. But I find myself thinking about some one of these soulless modern buildings where banks have a gigantic atrium for no reason and it's just completely um, empty with a pot plant in the corner and all this amazing natural light flooding in, illuminating nothing at all. So it would be great to, to bring a bit of life to one of those. Just a complete missed opportunity. Yeah, so, so many missed opportunities. I feel like the German Museum as well, they'd, they'd look after your wrists as well. they make sure your feet are properly articulated. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> An even better answer would be my house. So uh, what I'd like to do is sell my home and go and live somewhere where the property prices are incredibly low and where I have a, a Diplodocus room in the middle of the house and all the other rooms would just come off that central hall. And whenever you wanted to go from the kitchen to the dining room, you'd have to go through the Diplodocus hall. You could weave in between its legs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, well, I think that brings us to the end of all of the questions that I've got. Thank you so much for coming and being interviewed. Oh, thank you. It's been such fun. Okay, I think that brings us to the end. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Liz Martin Silverstone, Tom Fletcher, Nick Lupshire, Emily Keeble and Sophie Pollard. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on funding from you, our listeners. So if you've liked this episode, please consider supporting us on Patreon, where you'll gain access to additional multimedia content, and thanks to everyone who's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs. And follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.